Support for this podcast and the following message come from Corient. Corient provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Corient has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Corient has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Corient has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of plan investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com. You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. The man himself. Now, when I say, what are we here to see? You say, Love Courtney, I'm Courtney, I'm Courtney, I'm Courtney, I'm Courtney, I'm Courtney, what are we here to see? Let's go! Awesome. Uh, thank you for coming down here uh, tonight and joining us for a live comedy album book club. We're very excited tonight. Uh, we're going to be all listening together to some clips from the 1976 album simply titled Saturday Night Live. And as you may be able to guess, uh, it is made up of clips from the show. There was uh, nothing written for the album. It's all taken from their first two seasons, 1975 and 1976. So some of it works as audio comedy, and some of it will let you decide <laughs> on your own if you think it works. Uh, I will uh, just put out a little bit of a warning out there. There uh, is one sketch near the end that has um, some racial epithets in it. Um, so just be prepared for that. It's stuff you wouldn't normally hear today, but we thought it was important to include as a product of the time and something we'll definitely be talking about. Uh, so before we start uh, listening to the album, I would like to introduce our amazing selection of guests today. Uh, first of all, I have my producing partner, who's a comedy nerd and improv student. Please welcome Matthew Ardill. <laughs> He's got his own copy of the album. Very impressive. Don't worry about it. Here. Go. So why do, you, why do you call yourself a comedy nerd? Uh, I live, sleep, eat, and breathe comedy. Okay, fair enough. That's an interesting diet. <laughs> we like to hear that here at the Toronto Sketch Comedy Festival. Uh, next up, we have uh, a pair of two wonderful women from out west. Uh, from Calgary, we have Carrie Donaldson. And from Kelowna, Allie Entwistle. Together, they form the troupe Brunch. <laughs> Wow, look at the move in unison. I love this. The glasses out at the same time. Together. And you <laughs> and you'll recognize them from the video we just watched. And Welcome. our apologies. <laughs> <laughs> you recognize Brunch from the video we just watched, and I believe you're nominated. What are you nominated for? Uh, that's a great best question. one. I, I think guess, it's uh, outstanding comedy short. Awesome. Yeah. Applause for that. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Yes. We also have uh, from Toronto here who has been on Sunday Night Live, our Toronto uh, show here for a number of years with the troupe The Skechersons. He's also been on the Second City main stage and has written and performed in This Hour Has 22 Minutes. Please welcome Brandon Hackett. <laughs> How 
How are you, Brandon? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Great. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. All right. That's enough of that. Uh, <laughs> cool banter. <laughs> cool banter. It'll get better. Don't you worry. Uh, and our guest of honor, I'm very excited to introduce to you tonight. She's a veteran of SCTV and Saturday Night Live. And in recent years, she's been a performer in Women Fully Clothed and taught comedy at Humber College. Please welcome the one and only Robin Duke. <laughs> How are you, Robin? I'm very good, thank you. Very good. I just flew in from Timmins. And this boy. <laughs> my arms tight. <laughs> well, thank you for making the, the flight. How long is the flight from Timmins? It's an hour. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not too big a deal not then. Not at all. You're making a big deal out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only an hour. <laughs> but we didn't pay for that. So thank you very much for, uh, <laughs> for making the trip. We appreciate it. Uh, great. Okay. So we're going to get right into the album, folks. We're going to take some notes and listen to it. You guys can do the same. On all of your seats in the audience, you have a little piece of paper and a pencil. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, if you need a new medic alert bracelet, just write that down on the piece of paper and drop it in in this nice little Conan O'Brien themed uh, lunchbox here and I will periodically pull things out of there and see if it's appropriate for our panel and if it is we'll read it out loud. Make sense? Okay, good. All right. Uh, without any further ado, here is 1976's album Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Okay, so that is a sample. Uh, it's a good chunk of the album, Saturday Night Live. Uh, as most of you probably know, Saturday Night Live started in 1975. And as I said before, uh, this album is clips from the 1975 and 1976 season. We heard from Chevy Chase, Dan Aykroyd, Lily Tomlin, Gelda Radner, Jane Curtin. Uh, Lily Tomlin did the monologue. So, you know, names we all know. They huge stars thanks to this show. And this show is still with us. This is going to be, what, this fall, 44 years? Yeah. So uh, it's been around quite a while. Um, and we have a group of people here from, of different age ranges. And uh, it was all sort of exposed to us at different times. Uh, I was probably around 9 or 10 years old when I first started watching uh, reruns of stuff. I, I really got into the Blues Brothers and, and Dan Aykroyd probably after seeing uh, Ghostbusters. And then it was probably around 1989, that I started watching the show regularly with uh, Mike Myers, Dana Carvey, and then Will Ferrell and all them, and then later went back and watched a lot of those classic episodes. And I'm curious to hear how you guys all uh, came to discover this show. Why don't we start with you, Matt, since you're sitting right to my so, left. Uh, we'll go down right, the yeah. line. Um, I was, when I was a little kid, my mom worked nights, and uh, my dad was on business trips a lot, so I'd sneak down... Uh, we lived on the West Coast, so it was a little bit easier. Uh, would get it over the air a little bit earlier. Um, but it, it was probably you know, eight or nine and watching it on TV. This would be during the, the uh, Eddie Murphy era. Mm. And uh, so I remember in the morning watching Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dress Up and Mr. <laughs> <laughs> and everything, Mr. Uh, and then in the evening, it's like Mr. Robinson's neighborhood kind of thing. <laughs> so and your childhood like, consists of mainly misters. Yeah, Mr. Lots of misters. Well, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, an all Mr. Childhood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, I definitely grew up. I was almost raised on Saturday Night Live. Uh, mm. I would basically watch it with my siblings. Um, my parents, for whatever reason, didn't mind that I stayed up late on a Saturday night, watched it at a very young age. I think I was probably seven. Um, and cool. looking back, I probably missed a lot of the nuances of the jokes. I just right. loved the <laughs> idea of it, that all of these adults were just acting super silly. And I ripped them off the next day at school, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was very popular and funny because of it. And I've been doing it ever since. Awesome. <laughs> but now people notice, and they it's notice. awkward. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Allie? Um, yeah, I actually, I mean, when I was a kid and, like, teenager, I went to bed pretty early, you guys. 
because um, I'm responsible. <laughs> um, so I actually didn't get into SNL until I was in university, but boy, did I make up for lost time. Uh, it was like around when Kristen Wiig was in the cast and I just fell in love with her characters. And then what I did was I went through it chronologically, but backwards. I think mm. I went through 10 seasons in a year. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, was, it was rough, guys. My marks were really good in <laughs> university. Um, and yeah, I just became like enamored with it, like completely. And I, that was actually really when I decided I wanted to do comedy was through watching uh, that in early university. How far back? You went back 10 years? I, yeah. So I've watched, I've watched every single episode for like 10 years. Like, yeah, the, I guess like uh, 10 years ago starting. So I guess from 2000 or 2012 to 2002, which is a weird thing to do, like to watch <laughs> political comedy from 2002 uh, yeah. when you're like 21 and be like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Gondolisa guys, Rice, am I right? Do you right? do a lot of Clinton jokes and stuff So now? many, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The Monica Lewinsky, yeah, I had to read up on that. Um, <laughs> and then and then I also started watching from the beginning as well. So I tried to, but then, you know, I was like, wait, I should also live a life. Yeah. So I tried to. So you that. never met in the middle? I Not yet. Not yet. Still a goal. Okay. Still a goal, yeah. You're young. Yes, got time. Uh, Brandon, how about you? Uh, so my, my era of SNL, uh, or that I'm most... Uh, aware of being wa- of watching SNL is probably like the early '90s, mm-hmm. uh, that sort of thing. So I guess there's a lot of uh, like Mike Myers, and uh, I mean, there's the one Mike Myers, <laughs> but a lot of him, mm-hmm. and uh, <laughs> uh, I guess like uh, Dana Carvey and stuff like that. And um, mm-hmm. that was when I was earliest uh, aware of watching that show. But I, I wasn't super into it until probably about high school. I think it's where I don't know for a lot of people it's sort of like. In high school, that's when people start to really get an SNL, and often that's when people are like, "That's my, that's the best guest." Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess yeah, the key era of SNL for me was probably uh, well, yeah with Tina Fey and uh, mm-hmm. Jimmy Fallon and um, uh, Kristen Wiig and uh, uh, Lonely Island doing um, uh, uh, the uh, digital shorts and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, cool. And do you use any of that in your own stuff? Do you feel like you were influenced by it, or you have a favorite person? Uh, I the, think well, for, I think certainly the way that I write sketch now, and partly because I was on a show modeled after <laughs> Saturday Night Live for yeah, fair enough. several years, uh, certainly very influenced by the way that they uh, wrote and performed uh, sketch comedy on that show. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a lot of commercial parodies. Like even listen, listening to the clip, uh, there's a lot of commercial parodies. A lot more than I kind of imagined would be in sort of like a product of that particular time. And uh, I tend to write a lot. Uh, of commercial parodies and sort of in that voice and style. Um, cool. Yeah, but I can't think of like any particular, like, I don't know, I, I don't write any, I don't think I write any like Lonely Island style right. things. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff on there that I feel is sort of classic style sketches that a lot of people still do. Um, Lonely Island, I would say, is sort of the modern version of sketch or, or a more modern uh, version. Um, but that, that Shimmer sketch to me is just still a perfect uh commercial parody with the, with the double uh, use for the product, the dessert topping you can use to wax your floors. Uh, what about you, Robin? Do you remember uh, when you first... Oh, here first... we go. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was... Uh... I guess I was in the touring company at Second City. Uh, I was in university, and I was actually going down to Second City Theater and watching, like, Dan Aykroyd and J- Gilda Radner and... <laughs> All those uh, people on stage, and um, and then was aware uh, of them, you know, going down and sort of like in that world, uh, comedy world of Second City, and and hearing about them going down to watch. Um, I mean, not to watch, but to do this show right. that uh, was starting, and. Um, uh, so that was really, and I guess, uh, I, actually by the time it started, I think I was on main stage. Uh, so I didn't get to see a lot of Saturday Night Live because we didn't have video in, you know, <laughs> or in those days. Right. I think we may have, but I mean, it was just, you know. Yeah, you missed the that. show, you missed the show. You missed it. the show. So I was working usually Saturday nights, but I, wow. I knew, um, a lot of those people from right. Second City. Was that a big deal? Was that exciting? To oh, see. I think it, yeah, yeah, yeah it must it have been, right? Oh my God! I mean, uh, when I would go down to the theater and watch these, I mean, I just remember that first time going down to Second City, and you said, you know, watching Saturday Night Live. Well, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. This is right. what I want to do. I was at university at the time, and 
uh, I was going to be a teacher, and uh, I thought, no, no, I yeah. think this is this is where I belong. So now I'm a teacher. Yeah. I'm teaching. So full about circle. That. Full circle. I finished my university. So good that, for you. That enabled That's a me good to example a for you kids out there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Stay in school if you want to be a comedy school. legend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, just a reminder, folks, that anybody who has any questions, please write them down on the paper provided. You can walk up and drop it in at any time. And uh, we'll pretend we don't see you as to not interrupt our conversation. See? <laughs> Seamless. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> what do you think? Should I peek at what's in the box now or should I wait later? Till later? You want to wait a little bit? Okay, Ooh. we'll up tease the up yeah. the suspense. Tease it out. Yeah, yeah. good call. Um, cool. Okay, guys, who do you guys notice some differences uh, between comedy, the style of comedy, the kind of jokes you can get away with, um, how they treat audiences between what we just heard and maybe what we're seeing now on the show on Saturday Night Live. I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just also I was just going to say is I. Uh, I think the big, <laughs> the, the big thing to mention is uh, uh, in the uh, word association sketch that Chevy Chase does with um, Chevy Chevy Chase does with uh, uh, Richard Pryor is he yeah. he does say the N word yeah. uh, right at the apex of a sketch and I think that is something that uh, absolutely could not be done on uh, SNL of today. No. Um, do you think it shouldn't be done? If that sketch hadn't been done, do you think it shouldn't be done today? Uh, I mean. I think the uh, cultural milieu definitely matters quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think today, if you were to say that, I think it matters who's saying it uh, and for what purpose. So it's not necessarily intended to shock mm -hmm. uh, or just to sort of you know uh, <laughs> say the N word and have Giannis go like whoa, yeah. and then for you to be like oh, deal with it, freedom of speech. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Drop the mic and walk off stage. It's just not yeah, really. I think needs, yeah, I think there needs to be a, a intention behind uh, so it, under the optics of who who was saying it. I think today, I don't think today you could have someone who is not uh, black say that. Yeah. Um, or you'd need a really great sketch or something. Yeah, and yeah. it's re and neither happened really then, did it? I mean, it's it's not a great sketch, but it's a powerful one, and it's one that you know it is. I don't know if you'd call it a classic, but it's definitely one that people bring up when they talk about uh, old sketches from Saturday Night. Night Live and uh, yeah it doesn't feel like there's a big that it's really earned like it is shock value I mean I guess Pryor does become the hero and he wins at the end arguably but you could argue that the, the point of that sketch is to just get to say that and to shock well, people. Well what's interesting was that they have standards and practices mm -hmm. and uh, you know you're not allowed to say a lot of words mm -hmm. and it's shocking that they were allowed to say those words then you know it's mm -hmm. just that yeah. nobody stopped them there was nobody coming down you know, from, you know, the upper floors to, you know, the executives coming down and saying you can't say that or you have to find another way of saying it. It's really shocking that it was. Yeah. You know, well, that, at that, that, that time might, that nobody, uh, you know, nobody said don't do that. Right. Well, I, but I think they would still say don't swear and things like oh, that. Oh, absolutely. But because, yeah. you know, you could argue because of white privilege, nobody who was in charge it was thought it was a big deal. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. things definitely changed that way. And also the way they, ta like, watching SNL now, there's not a lot of sexual comedy in it. Mm -hmm. Very, mm -hmm. like, none. Whereas, like, pretty much every time Chevy was making a comment, there was some sexual innuendo there. The Weekend Update, like I've been rewatching mm -hmm. the first season and it's just steeped with it mm -hmm. in ways yeah. that I don't feel comfortable with watching and that would never be on TV today. And they made it even part of his character, oh, yeah. Chevy Chase's character. Like when he starts that uh, thing, I was kind of surprised at how, you know, they were alluding to sex on the highway type of thing. And uh, now we just, we don't want the person telling us the news to be that guy like that's not charming or cute or funny anymore that's that's kind of the bad guy these days yeah. and I wonder if then like I guess people love Chevy Chase they thought he was charming at the time I mean as time goes by I think people <laughs> like him less and less for various behaviors he was very charming though 
Yeah. Chevy Chase was, I think, like, oh, so charming. Like yeah. all the National Lampoons, I found him very sure. charming. Well, he's got he's got a really interesting mix of like aloof and uh, incapable, but sarcastic. He's got a mm-hmm. weird confidence that he doesn't deserve to have. <laughs> <laughs> and there's comedy there, I guess. Um, anything else? Are there other things you guys notice? Like, uh, um, I just- would say about like the sexual comedy. I think like then I guess like it was exciting and edgy, and now if you did that, it would just be like easy and boring and like. Shock. Yeah. Like you can, like you can find that very easily. I don't, you know, a lot of shows are like, sure. you know, go to a like an open mic, um, <laughs> and you'll see it. <laughs> um, it's just that now it's like not, yeah. it's not clever or exciting. It's just like yay. The, it was the penis was the punchline. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's still funny to some people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Matt. like <laughs> no, but like sometimes sexual comedy can be like obviously it's totally. hilarious. I right. you know, but it's like it's that can't be the you know the only reason you're laughing can't be saying the n word or like like whatever. It has to be there has to be something more exciting right. going on. Well, it had never been done before. That was the mm. thing. Like that 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 getting things past the standards and practices was what it was all. All about for the writers and for the actors was how far can we get you know what can we get on air because mm. it nothing like that was on air yeah. so it was all a big uh, you know that was the challenge for the for the people on the show right yeah. and they had uh, I think Carlin was the first guest on the first show right yeah, he needed a lot of stand up and he was sort of the poster boy for things you can't say on TV mm-hmm. and yeah it, it felt like a bunch of hippies just trying to break the rules exactly. late at night when people yeah. weren't paying attention right yeah. it's kind of exciting yeah it was yeah and in that first season they were really figuring out like the format like the first six episodes oh yeah like half of it is stand up or like mm-hmm. the second episode Paul Simon did the entire show like there was a, a, a Albert Brooks movie and then there was nothing no, none of the regular cast members actually appeared in sketches it, it was like very little actually so it's like I think this this album has to draw from like two seasons because they were still figuring out what's what's a sketch that works on this show and what doesn't yeah um, I was, uh, it was interesting, too, that what they selected to put on the album itself, because it feels like they wanted to have sort of a well-rounded example of what the show is, but some of that stuff would definitely benefit from having the visuals. I mean, obviously, nothing for the show is written for the ear, um, but I'm, I'm also always intrigued at how much comedy does work for the ear. Like, so much of what uh, is done in comedy is is verbal. Um, and, uh, you know, th- this show sometimes makes great use of the visual medium, but a lot of the times it's just, oh, they spent tens of thousands of dollars on a living room set and the rest is just banter. Like, we don't really need the visuals. Um, what do you guys, do you guys think anything didn't work on this album or uh, because I, it's a uh, visuals would have been better? Well, I definitely think that the... The opener, the cold yeah. open, uh, definitely. Oh yeah, w- with a big pratfall, someone yeah. falling down. Yeah, definitely relying on, <laughs> on the, the cultural yeah. context of like knowing uh, about Chevy Chase and what his sort of thing was. Like right. his main thing was, uh, which is just doing pratfalls. Right. Uh, and his imitation of Gerald Ford, he doesn't put on a voice at all, which is yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, but audibly, yeah. you might not know who it's supposed to be either. If, if, I mean, it's obviously Gerald Ford because of the time it takes place and who he is. But but to, yeah. to a listener who didn't know. Yeah. It'd be like doing like, hey, it's me, Trump. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys want some soda? <laughs> that's, that's the thing he said. <laughs> what yeah, I that... noticed was that the um, uh, a lot of the sketches were longer. And, it, you know, mm. the back of the history of Second City, those mm. kinds of relationship sketches or, you know, the, just the sketches seemed a lot longer than they are now. Mm. Um and uh, the characters, um, you know, it was uh, just, I guess, longer sketches coming from, you know, they were all coming from Second City and that a lot of the sketches had endings. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, that was yeah. Great point. They really made an effort mm-hmm. to have an ending. But I guess the shorter the sketches become, the more difficult it is to find those endings. So yeah, you don't have the arc of the story no, to, to work no, with, I guess. No, I really no. liked that, um, the bedtime story yeah. with that Dan Aykroyd. Mm-hmm. And Gilda yeah, Radner. Yeah, I love right. the voices they did. That yeah, to me, yeah. that's a great audio sketch. You don't mm-hmm. need to yeah. see what's happening. And uh, and that one, yeah, we sort of keep going with these examples, and they get more and more specific. And I feel like these days, 
they would just run out of examples and exactly. fade to black. But yep. th- but it had an ending. Yeah. She had the mm-hmm. turn, yeah. and she knew a bit about cars, and that made it cute and that, fun, yeah, and then that's when great. you're out. Yeah. yeah. So there was yeah. an effort made there. For yeah, <laughs> to tell a little story, right? <laughs> tell a story. That's yeah. great, yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, just to hear Danny, like when I remember him on stage, so verbal, so yeah. you know, his characters had so much reference. You know, whatever he was playing, he had all the words to define who that, what the occupation occupation was or so he comes at that as the garage mechanic with all that language it's yeah. so fantastic he and seems like, like a singular talent that way to be able yeah. to just memorize things and spout it off oh, with yeah. a great speed yeah. he was a, an influence for me and I, I, I really respected that yeah. just just note perfect he was so specific like yes. you're saying like yes. you know a lot of times now you'll see they're kind of filling the blanks in between glances at the cue cards and <laughs> you get the idea but it's not the same as that rapid fire specificity that is just so entertaining you know, and mind-boggling to watch. Yeah. So, to watching someone do something we can't do, I think, is always yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. And he, he could do that. Yeah. Well, the show's very, like, I find now, and I still actually do enjoy the show from time to time, um, or a lot, if you're listening, Lauren Michaels. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Lauren. You'd be a great Number fit, Brandon. Um, Hi. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but happening. it does sort of, uh, it is sort of uh, like clockwork now. If you sort of watch it, it is quite, mm-hmm. uh, quite stagey and quite sort of like line by line. And again, that is sort of an influence in the way that I, I feel like I write comedy now, which is very like, okay, great. This is meant for uh, when I was in Sunday Night Live. It'd be, if I was writing something for the host, uh, I'd be like, okay, great. I've got to make this clear and straightforward for the host so that they can get everything in my jokes pop and I feel great when I go home later in the night. Uh, but um, it's sort of like compared to uh, compared to, as you were saying, Robin, uh, that sort of uh, the, the kind of like energy of the uh, like earlier days, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, it sort of can't compare. Like I find the early days, uh, you listen to those sketches and uh, because it's all Second City performers yeah. uh, and there's such a huge like improvisational kind of like uh, right. uh, energy where they're sort of feeding off of each other. So it's sort of like right. a little bit more alive and you can kind of... The, the audience sort of being there kind of adds to the excitement, I think. Mm-hmm. It's sort of mm-hmm. like when 30 Rock does those live, did those two mm-hmm. live episodes yeah. right. and sort of like really argued for the, um, uh, the the joy and like importance and urgency of live episodes. It was sort of like, I feel like watching those episodes, I was just sort of like, oh yeah, that's why it's exciting to watch live TV. You know, there's mm-hmm. a good energy that should sort of be there. And when you have mm-hmm. SNL right now, that's a bit... Um, planned out feeling it's sort of like right it, it, it doesn't kinda, have the wild freewheeling sort of seat of your pants feeling it had in the yeah. early days yeah yeah and i feel like they took on more that they really tried to learn their characters and their lines in the old days you don't see them looking at cue cards as much there was a they were drilling well, you know yeah you know when i came to it, onto the show john belushi said to me learn how to use the cue cards that was his one piece of advice. <laughs> Make sure that, well, that you, um, because they do so many changes between, well, they do a lot of changes between dress and air. So if you're uh, dependent on memorizing the lines, then right. you're lost. So you have right. to know how to play the cameras. So huh. that's... Uh, that's something. That's a totally new skill. Uh, uh, yeah, from it the is. Stage. It yeah. is. Yeah, definitely. What, what was that like? How did that? How did it happen that you went from Second City Main Stage to being on Saturday Night Live? Well, um, uh, what Catherine was doing. Uh, Catherine's my best. Catherine O'Hare is my best friend from high school. So is that right? She is sort of. Are you of still always, friends? Yeah. Yeah. We're, she's always kind of paved the way for me. It's been very great of her. Um, uh, kind of dragged me along to things, and I've <laughs> gone along. And uh, Catherine was doing Saturday Night Live, and I think she decided that she didn't want to do it anymore, or they were going to do Second City, and she wanted to go back to Second City. Because SCTV was still happening. Oh, yes, yeah. SCTV, SCTV yeah. that's right. So they, I think SCTV, my husband's here, and he has much better knowledge of all the details. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, if I start rambling. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I think Catherine was, NBC was going to do SCTV. So she called me and said that, you know, she was leaving. Fly down. And um, and that's, I flew down. I did not 
audition. Huh. I just, uh, Dick Ebersole was the producer at the time, and I just uh, I just went down and, and met with him, met with some of the writers, and then I was just hanging around, and Catherine said, we got to go, we got to go. And I said, well, what do I do? She says, oh, just go into his office and tell him you have to go, so you need an answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow, hardball. Oh, yeah. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so I did. I did what she told me to do. And uh, I said, you know, we got to go. What's, you know, what's happening? And so I got, that's how I got the job. <laughs> wow. And that's it. I didn't have to audition. And, Amazing. Uh, there's no way I would have gotten that gig if I had to audition or do any of that. I wouldn't get that job now. And how I'm do you know? Really, I just know. People are so good. There's so much comedy out there. I mean, you're the only Mrs. T, I think, that I've well, ever there seen. Well, there is that. There is that. <laughs> but, you know, at the time, there weren't, a lot of, there weren't a lot of people doing comedy. There was just, they were just yeah. pulling them from uh, Second City Chicago, Second City Toronto, maybe some stand-up people from, yeah. Uh, so I just really got lucky. Right place, right time. Well, I think there was some talent involved, too. Oh, you're lovely. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Uh, My my parents are here tonight, Gary and Helen DeLine. Say hi, guys. (laughs) They've been telling me a story my whole life. In 1981, they went to the second city here in Toronto. Oh. And it was your last night before oh, going to Saturday Night Live. Oh, my heaven. And apparently Martin Short was at the show as yeah. well, and, and yeah. Catherine was there. Yeah. And my one of my mom's favorite comedic things that has ever happened, I don't know if you remember, but you sang a song called I Hate Liver. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's that old Second City. Uh, that's that Chicago scene, yeah. I remember you doing that, Robert, till the day I got <laughs> Do you remember how it goes at all? I hate liver. I, Gilda used to do, I think I used oh, to yeah. do Gilda's part in that. I hate liver, liver makes me quiver. Liver makes me quiver all the time. Liver, 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 the anticipation was it well no because it, well, I guess there was excitement and anticipation but it just seemed like was it logical to you to go to that I guess because yeah. Catherine had gone and I right. guess okay I'll go there was excitement was I excited Hendrick it happened, fast. It happened very yeah. fast it did it happened how long have you been with your husband Hendrick <laughs> a long time. Second season of SNL. <laughs> oh, wow. 77? 76? 76. 76. Wow. Congratulations, guys. Very cool. Yeah, it's not All right. I've been focusing a lot on Ms. Duke here. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious about, we were sort of talking about the different eras, and it seems like we all sort of gravitate towards the early days. Do, do you? Uh, but there's also points where we sort of came online. Um, do you guys have different favorite eras or eras that influenced you uh, besides the, the first season or so? I, for me, the, the Mike Myers era. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I remember seeing him on City Limits before he made the jump from Toronto wow. to New York. So I was like, wait a second. I know that Wayne Campbell character. Ah, interesting. So, it's like, so I so like seeing him, like, that's a guy from, like, an hour away from me on right. TV. Right, so it's fun to see him come up and yeah. succeed. So, so that sort of made that stick for me, and that was, like, okay. early high school for me. And just Fair really, enough. Really stuck. Yeah. Carrie? Um, I definitely, the first era was... Like the Chris Farley era for me. Ah, cool. That's cool. when I was like, yeah, I was ripping him off a lot. Um, <laughs> and does that does that era still hold up for you? Do you still uh, think it's great yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's always going to have a nostalgic like sure. part of my heart. Uh, and he gave so much too. Oh, he was he just such a gave so entertainer. Much. And like, I always try to like embody that level of commitment. But the era that really like showed me that I had a place in comedy was for sure, you know, the Tina Fey, Kristen Wiig. Um, when she came on the scene, the way she played women and just like very 
everyday women trying, you know, mm. and just the nuance, like women that I could identify with. And I felt like, oh, there's also that element of comedy that reflects who I am in my voice. And I just, mm. yeah, that's when I really, I really took off with comedy. I was like, cool. here we are. Here we are. Do you feel like the show lacked a feminine voice before then? Uh, I mean, or female voice or woman voice? I don't yes know, and I don't no. Say it right. Yes and no. It was there, but, um, it, I think it truly hit its stride when I started to see, like I personally started to lean in and notice mm. when Kristen Wiig was on screen. Cause cool. you couldn't take your eyes off of her for sure. Right. And she was doing something like you could feel it that no one else had really seen at that point. Right. And it was very much what was happening then. So. And we've gotten more of that since then. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Oh yeah. Yes. Uh, Cecily Strong, Kate McKinnon are just, uh, Powerhouses on that show. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It just kind of opened the door and just like, like not that she, you know, was the only one doing it, but it just felt like she had hit a, a stride. Cool. And everyone else was like, okay, okay, <laughs> me too. I, I also get out of your way. Awesome. <laughs> Allie? Um, yeah, I think Kristen Wiig for me also was huge. Mm -hmm. I think that whole era with like uh, Kristen and like Bill Hader and um, Fred Armisen and Jason Sudeikis and Andy Samberg mm -hmm. and all those people and yeah, just but I also like Cecily Strong and Edie Bryant, um, like the whole era where um, oh what are the names now? Um, Chris and who are the head writers? Oh, oh, Chris Kelly, Chris and Sarah Kelly, Snyder. and yeah, Sarah Snyder. They are two. Like when they were head writers, was so, like mm -hmm. some of the funniest stuff I've seen. And I like I don't know. I'm a big fan. Like I've been a big fan of SNL. Like I was like when people are like you know you always say people oh, no this is not funny anymore. But I just like it's like people always say that you know it's not funny sure, anymore. Yeah. It's not as yeah. good anymore. And that's what I wonder too. Yeah, is it, is it because like, of the era we're removed from, or we just well, critique things in different ways? Well, because you're nostalgic for what right. you saw in high school, exactly. or you, you know you remember the good stuff. You forget that Chevy J, Chevy J said the N word. Um, <laughs> you're like ah whatever. Um, you know, and it's like you you you, you just pick and choose. But the, the fact that there's still a thing happening right now when the internet is you know killing everything, um, where mm. people get together every week and do a live 90 minute sketch show, which shouldn't be done. <laughs> like it's not, no, like that's it's not very old fashioned kind of entertainment. Yeah. Really. Like it's not the way that comedy like really like makes, like you could make it way funnier. Like their digital shorts are funnier usually because right. they're produced and they take time to do them right. and they're very well done. But it's still like this place where like all the incredibly funny people go and like marinate together. And some of the stuff that's created is so funny. And I just, yeah, yeah, I'm very passionate about that because it's great. And yeah, Chris Kelly and uh, Sarah Snack Schneider are just oof, very funny people. Cool. Writers. Yeah. Brandon? Yeah. I'd actually like to really uh, echo the Chris Kelly, Sarah Schneider mm -hmm. era. Um, cool. <laughs> because a lot of really great content came out of those years. And like, mm -hmm. uh, I think one voice that they really helped push up was uh, Julio Torres. Yes, um, yes, yes. So funny. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wells for Boys is perhaps yes. my favorite sketch. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think, uh, uh, what was the dolls for uh, like uh, children with evil stepmothers or something? <laughs> yeah. I think he wrote balconies yeah. for boys when they're ready to announce something. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. So funny. He's yeah. he's truly wonderful, and uh, they really um, because Chris Kelly uh, uh, Chris Kelly is queer, so it sort of enabled I think a lot more of a uh, queer forward kind of uh, open. It, it sort of opened up the uh, 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 types of jokes and references that you could sort of make on that show. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also say um, probably what I maybe consider my ideal era of SNL, like when I sort of was like, okay, this is what the show is, this is what the show is, is probably, yeah, Tina Fey as a host of Weekend Update. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Seth Meyers, uh, sort of like rising prominence in the show a little bit. Um, uh, Amy Poehler there. Uh, um, uh, oh, uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, Seth Meyers? Or? Uh, yeah, Seth Meyers. Uh, uh, Portlandia. Will, Will, uh, oh, Fred Armisen. Fred Armisen. Why did I forget his name? I it's love Fred Armisen. <laughs> <laughs> Fred Armisen, uh, Kristen Wiig, uh, all of those people sort of together. Uh, and uh, Lonely Island kind of uh, providing a bit of a... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sound so lame, but like a young hip uh, <laughs> kind of tonal contrast to the sort of like uh, feel of a show that was sort of right. what SNL that was sort of like the SNL what SNL felt like to me that was sort of the mm -hmm. format concretized I felt for me it felt that uh, 
the format started to kind of unravel for me a little bit when uh, Lonely Island sort of left uh, because then uh, you didn't have the digital shorts anymore um, and that like you did but they just were like different in tone like mm-hmm. they just felt like right. you know like a continuation of the show's regular tone so it felt a little bit like Less like you were getting like a little bit of a break from the regular form- formula and yeah, cutting cool. into this new thing. Cool. But yeah, that's my All right. answer. So, Robin, you're in a unique position because y- you were I've doing comedy before I've the show started. <laughs> You've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah. who, were, who were some of your influences love, besides Catherine and uh, oh, well, people you, you know, knew? That's, uh, but I, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I loved all that. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fr- the Fred Armiston, Bill Hader, those mm-hmm. years, and, and Jason Sedate, and Keenan Thompson, that sh- that sketch where he does what? what what's, what's up with what's that? That's so Come ridiculous. On, that's the best. Yeah. And Jason Sudeikis yeah. was yeah. dancing. Oh, just dancing. Yeah. He doesn't Hilarious. say a word. Yeah. He comes Hilarious. out. He dances so with funny. such commitment. You, that's a Halloween it's costume you can buy now. Oh, it's yeah. so <laughs> good. And it's so just funny. like, it's just joyous. That mm-hmm. that sketch is yeah. joyous. That's like they put so much into about it. The alchemy, and like everybody coming together. Yeah, it's madness. And 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 uh, Bill Hader is the guest that never Lindsay gets Buckingham. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lindsay yeah. Buckingham. And then there's that one episode Lindsay where they Buckingham. had Lindsay Buckingham. Yeah, the real Lindsay oh, the real Buckingham. Lindsay Buckingham. Yeah. Next to Hader. Next to Hader. And neither of them got a time. I know that's <laughs> so, it's like that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. that's what my about before the show when you were doing Second City? Did you have did you have favorite comedians? Were you influenced? by comedy albums or comedians oh, of the I, day? Uh, well, my husband introduced me to Albert Brooks, that, that album, which was amazing. Which I one? Do that. you know the name uh, of it? What's the name yeah, of what's it? What's the name of it? <laughs> You'll know. Um, I can't remember. There's two of them. Okay. Two of them from the, the 70s, I guess, yeah. early 70s. It's great. Cool. It was great. And who I loved, you know, uh, I loved Richard Pryor. I loved, um, you know, Carol Burnett. I loved... Um, Jack Benny, uh, oh, I loved yeah, watching amazing. the Beverly Hillbillies. You know, <laughs> I mean, just big stupid comedy, except for of course Richard Pryor. But when he would do that little kid, you know, that uh, what was the name of that? His little, he used to do a little boy on Ed Sullivan. All Ed Sullivan. <laughs> all right, I'm going home. It's time for bed. <laughs> That's it. Uh, we have to wrap up shortly. I have a question okay. from the audience for Brun. Ooh, yeah. If you had to take a bit from this album and make it your own, oh, what would you choose and what twist would you put on it? Intrigue. Oh, really that is a really good one. Mm-hmm. I, oh, okay, well, I just love Lily Tomlin, but she's she got her own bit. She yeah. can do her own thing. <laughs> um, okay, well, honestly, with New Shimmer, I find myself like being, like the lines are so well crafted that I find myself being jealous. Like I can feel yeah. the joy of saying them because right. they fit like such a perfect puzzle. Yeah. Well, yeah. But they don't waste any words in that either no it's very economical sketch and it's one of those things where like sometimes you like you're in a sketch and the wording is so well done that like when you're you say one line and like the audience is laughing and you've got the next line's coming and you know it's like perfect and just the joy before you say it and then getting to say it is oh it's good yeah yeah nice okay what do you think yeah i would actually i would say that uh I don't know. I really like jam names because I just feel like it's like oh jam names. <laughs> such a just, that is like, valid. So ridiculous. Game of insanity. That yeah. Happens to such a degree that I was just like I want to play. And it's based on that jam that's been around forever. It's Smuckers is the Smuck- name of it, Smuckers. right? With a name yeah. like Smuckers, it must be good. Yeah, that's yeah. and yeah, that's a it's a uh, that's a perfect sketch yeah. to me too. Just yeah. ridiculous. Just heightening it yeah. to the nth degree. I can uh, also really see us doing a full hour show on natural racehorses. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, come see that next yes. year. Is our <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of that other. Uh, well, she did that uh, character all the time, Emily yeah. Latella, and there was one that she did all the, uh, that was. Uh, I'm. I don't know why everyone has problems with violins on television. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a yeah. good. Uh, one last question, guys. Would you say this import is an? Um, would you say this is an important album for this generation of uh, comedians to listen to? What makes Saturday Night Live important today? That's our last guest question. Oh. 
Um, I guess, yeah, I think it's, I think it's important is like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I guess like, uh, I think it's important because it's like, guess what? Not all of it holds up. Mm-hmm. And when people are very reverent of things that happened in the past, it's great because it's a cool institution. They've got great stories, but it's also, uh, like, I don't know, it's good to look back and be like, guys, there's still, I don't know. It wasn't all funny and some of it's still funny. And, yeah. uh, we're yeah, just like upward and onward. I think it's just so weird that they put out an album of just TV clips and they've never done it since. Do you think they should do it again? Uh, Try? I don't know. Maybe. I think we're getting a resurgence in comedy albums. Yeah, I mean, we are. I I mean, I... I, It was sort of the the thing of the day because you didn't have a VCR, so Mm -hmm. you wanted these bits. That was how you got was on an album. I mean, I... True, that's true. Uh, so, well, I you mean, could listen I, I, at home. If Robin could have listened to this at home on Sundays after she was working on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> you missed the show. <laughs> Fair enough. Any final thoughts, guys, on this it's album? It's a visual or? show, too. I yeah. mean, true. It's physical. It's, yeah. uh, it's not written for radio I, no. or for listening. I, I don't think it's, uh, yeah, I don't think as an album it holds up, definitely. Would any of you be interested in uh, writing for the ear, trying uh, specifically oh, audio yeah. comedy? Yeah, love it. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah. All right, you're hired. Okay. <laughs> that That's was easy. This whole thing was just my pitch for Robin Duke to work on my uh, <laughs> audio comedy. Well, guys, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming here, and uh, you can uh, check these guys out in various forms. Uh, Brunch, Carrie Donaldson and Ali Entwistle have their own podcast called yeah. You've Got Brunch. Uh, so you can check that out. Brandon Hackett, you're on Twitter uh, doing funny things. And wh- where else can we find you and see what you're up to? Oh, well, I have another sketch fest uh, show with uh, my uh, sketch par- partner right now, Jonathan Langdon. Uh, it's called the nice. Hackett and Langdon. That's happening next Saturday, the 16th at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, just upstairs at the Theater Center. Beautiful. Uh, and generally, uh, I don't know, I'll be doing improv and sketches and stuff like that around town. Mostly Bad Dog. and right. uh, Or uh, I live by bathroom. And Dupont, if you want to just <laughs> just uh, go hang by, by. <laughs> just hope he shows up on that corner. Uh, and Robin, of course, you're uh, you're in the sketch troupe. Is it true that you've been doing this since 2004? Yeah. <laughs> it's called Women Fully Clothed. Women Fully Clothed. We have a new show. It's not the same material. <laughs> Good to know. Good to yeah. know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, not even the Beatles have been together that long, <laughs> you know? But we're, uh, So yeah. you're saying you're better than the Beatles, which means you're better than Jesus, right? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, ba- yeah. close. Based, <laughs> close. You have a longer run, maybe. Neck and neck. And neck. <laughs> So where can we find info in those shows? Uh, oh, we're, we're, oh, God, we'll get a re- website up eventually. Uh, okay. That's coming soon. All right. We've we'll got, keep looking until yeah, it's there. Yeah, you'll find us. Awesome. We're in Sudbury at the end of, at the, end of the month. Yeah, so. There you go. <laughs> yeah. My dad, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, uh, porn sites. <laughs> and, of course, you can find Comedy Album Book Club, uh, Twitter, Facebook, or uh, the podcast of your channel. This uh, this should be up Monday, March 11th, and then you can be listening uh, all next week. We will have interviews with all the Canadians nominated for Best Comedy Album for the Junos, so make sure you check that out. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining us here. This has been Comedy Album Book Club. You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, excursions, and more in one place. There are over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from, so you can find something for everyone. And Viator offers free cancellation and 24-7 customer support for worry-free travel. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator. Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the 5-Hour Energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry-on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HETRAVEL at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One-time use only. Not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HETRAVEL to save 20%.